This is an unlawful assembly. You are ordered to disperse. After Bloody Sunday, when state troopers clubbed and tear gassed peaceful protesters, Jonathan answered Martin Luther King Jr.'s call and traveled to Selma, Alabama. King asked Northern clergy, particularly white clergy, to come south and march alongside blacks for equal voting rights. Jonathan, who was studying at what is now the Episcopal Divinity School in Cambridge, Massachusetts, planned to stay for the weekend. He ended up in Alabama five months. Most of the white civil rights workers who went to Selma decided to go back and get on with their lives. And that didn't sit well with Jonathan. He really believed that it would be hypocritical for him to just show up for a few days and say, I care about you and your life, and then leave. Then I got, you know, after I got to know John, you know, uh, it just came easy. I didn't, didn't look at the color of skin then, you know. He didn't act no different from us. He, ate out the same dishes we ate out. So he just ate what we ate. He, he took a bath in the same bath till we took a bath and used the same commode, you know? So he was just, uh, he was just like family. In fact, he said we was his, you know, he called me his uh, adopted, say I adopted him. I can remember one day when I was, uh, when I was coming up and uh, Jonathan was staying here, and I think I had to uh, get behind on my lesson or something. And, uh, and Jonathan was, was telling me about uh, uh, the, the good side of, of doing your homework and uh, paying attention to the classroom and, and, and getting your work. And uh, it, it kind of struck me back then because first thing I thought about, I said, well, uh, why this white man so serious about us like this, you know? But that night when, when he sat me down and, and he scolded me and he, and he talked to me and he told me why, why he did that because he cared about me and he wanted me to make something out of myself. He was, the, uh, he, he was just there when we needed him, always. As Jonathan became more involved, the stakes got higher and the danger greater. After just 48 hours in Selma, James Reeb, a minister who arrived with Jonathan, was beaten to death by an angry white mob outside a Ku Klux Klan hangout. He was the first white civil rights worker murdered in 1965. Far from affording him respect and protection, Jonathan's clerical collar made him a marked man. As a white activist, holding peaceful protests, working to integrate a local Episcopal church, and registering black voters, Jonathan was more hated than African Americans, considered an outside agitator, a traitor to his race. Jonathan refused to be intimidated, and it became apparent to him that if he continued to stand by his convictions, which he was 100% committed to do, that his life was in danger, and he was willing to take that risk. No surprise to Jonathan's childhood friend, Bob Perry, who could see early on Jonathan's life building to a heroic moment. Well, John was uh, 11 days older than I am. So the story that I get is that we first met in the nursery down at the old Elliott Community Hospital here in Keene. They were inseparable, neighbors and classmates. Jonathan wasn't much of an athlete, but always a fighter. We had boxing gloves in the garage at the house, and John, I don't think, ever stood in the conventional stance. He just came out and started flailing. Jonathan preferred fighting for the underdog. He would go out of his way to go and include them in any way that he could. He and his younger sister had a rigid upbringing. His father a doctor, his mother a socialite, with high expectations for her children. His mother was very strict, and he would rebel to some extent. Mostly just typical boyhood mischief, like the secret club Jonathan and Bob formed in the crawl space under Jonathan's house on Summer Street. We took a bench in there to sit on, and John, even at that point, was serious enough that he created an altar, and he led a ceremony before every meeting uh, that we had. It was ye loyal knights of the Royal Order of the Skull and Bones Society. At night, Jonathan would break into schools and churches to climb their towers and steeples. John knew where the low boards were and convinced me one night to join him. To say that I was scared is 
a real understatement. We each smoked a cigarette while we were sitting up in there. I was sure that people were going to see those two little red lights on the end of the cigarettes, and we were caught. It was one and done for Bob. Jonathan was a regular. It was a, a great place for solace, sit, contemplate. Jonathan was more introspective than most kids. Smart, too, he just didn't study. His turning point came one night after sneaking out for a joyride with friends. He crawled out the second story bathroom window, crossed the roof, then climbed down a ladder. John slipped and fell. He missed the cement walkway, landed dirt or whatever, and it may have been snow, it was February. Jonathan was busted up, hospitalized for a month. He had a lot of time to think about where he was in his life and where he wanted to go in his life. I think he faced up to the fact that he was starting to drift in a direction that he ought not to. Years later, as a seminary student, Jonathan would give his first sermon here at St. James in downtown Keene. Jonathan would never preach at St. James again gunned down on the streets of Alabama, pushing aside 17-year-old Ruby Sales when a white part-time sheriff's deputy aimed his 12-gauge shotgun right at her. Well, when we got to the store, when we got to the store, I was in front, John was behind, John, Joyce, and Father Morris Rowe, they were behind me. And when we got to the door, I think I had walked up about one or two steps. This guy was standing in the door with a shotgun. And he told us that the store, he said, the store is closed. And he said, if you don't get off of this goddamn property, I'm gonna blow your damn brains out. Next thing I knew, some, someone had pulled me from behind and I heard a shotgun blast. And I looked, and I saw John falling. I saw John fall. In the struggle for civil rights, there was no place more dangerous than Lowndes County, Alabama. Segregation was enforced by violence, lynching rampant. Its nickname, Bloody Lowndes. Jonathan Daniels, who had been organizing in Selma, was itching to move on to Lowndes County, where voting rights were under siege. He was not going to accept no once he thought that it was necessary for a white person to be in Lowndes County. Jonathan would become the first white civil rights worker in Lowndes County, working closely with Ruby Sales, who skipped classes at nearby Tuskegee University to join the Freedom Fighters. She's now 68 years old and living in Atlanta, Georgia. I thought he was a very complex, multidimensional, loyal, brilliant, provocative, push the envelope kind of person. Ruby hadn't known a lot of white people, and certainly none like Jonathan. He learned in, in Keene, New Hampshire, to stretch the limits of class. And that, had, that really served him well, because it, he was able, he was flexible. He was able to get along with people from a variety of backgrounds. At the time, 80% of Lowndes County was black, and not one of them had ever cast a vote. Despite threats from segregationists, Jonathan, Ruby, and the legendary Stokely Carmichael would canvass the neighborhoods, mostly farms, danger around every corner. It was incredibly frightening to be riding down Highway 80 and all of a sudden two pickup trucks would appear and they would have guns on their racks. Jonathan traded his borrowed red Volkswagen for a faster getaway car. And Jonathan had been chased several times also and he learned to be a very good driver in Lowndes County because your life depended on whoever was under that will had to know how to drive that car or you would not have made it. 
One Saturday afternoon on a sweltering August day, Jonathan and Ruby joined about 20 teenage protesters from Fort Deposit who were picketing stores that forced blacks to enter from a back door and pay higher prices for goods. When we got there that morning, there was a white mob waiting for us with baseball bats, garbage cans, yelling and screaming. It was terrifying. Within minutes, they were arrested and hauled off to the Hainville jail on a garbage truck. That's Jonathan entering the squalid jail, thinking he'd be released in two hours. Instead, they spent six long, hot, humid days in tiny, crowded cells with overflowing toilets and no running water. It was filthy. It was hot. We were terrified because the jailer said that they were, we were going to be raped. But yet their spirits were never broken, Jonathan lifting up the others. I'm sure he trembled in his boots at many points in being in jail. But I think his courage and his resolve outweighed his fear. He would lead them in song, their voices heard blocks away. That's how we got through. Without music, we would not have made it. So every opportunity we got, we were singing. Those freedom songs were our lifeline. And then abruptly, on the sixth day in jail, August 20th, 1965, they were released. No bail, no explanation. We knew something instinctively didn't feel right. Not only because he let us out and there was nobody to meet us, but also what didn't feel right, the streets were empty. Jonathan, Ruby, and two others, another black teenage girl and a young white Catholic priest, headed across the street to buy a soda at Barner's cash store. Waiting for them at the door, Tom Coleman, a white part-time sheriff's deputy with a loaded 12-gauge shotgun. And it happens so fast. He says, B-I-T-C-H. I'll blow your GD brains out. Because I'm in the front. And before I can process the meaning of the words, Jonathan pulls on my blouse. thing I know, shotgun blasts. I hear shots. And I think, and I see Jonathan's body flying up in the sky, as if it were flying up in the sky. And I say to myself, this is what you're dead. This is what it means to be dead. In that split second, Jonathan pushed Ruby aside, protecting her life, sacrificing his own. Ruby lay still, another shotgun blast. Tom Coleman hit the Catholic priest in the back. He would survive, the other teen escaped. The murder scene was quickly cleaned up as if nothing had happened. Obviously, I was traumatized by the whole experience. For months, I couldn't talk. I mean, I could speak, but I wouldn't speak. It wasn't until Tom Coleman's trial one month later that Ruby found the words. Well, what was great for me is that you have to understand, I was defending Jonathan that day, and that made me feel good that I was saying to the courtroom what he would never get an opportunity to say. Tom Coleman claimed he acted in self-defense and was acquitted by an all-white, all-male jury. When I walked out of that courtroom and got to the privacy of my own room, you can imagine how I cried. And what I cried for was not for myself, but for the fact that Jonathan was no longer there. In Keene, on the day of Jonathan Daniels' murder, his best friend Bob Perry ran into Jonathan's mother, who was celebrating her birthday at a local restaurant. She hadn't heard from him. She was very worried. John never forgot her birthday. 
On the way home, Bob and the world learned Jonathan was dead. If your last wish in life is uh, I want to have left the place better off than what I found it, he certainly did. Hundreds of mourners poured into St. James Episcopal Church for Jonathan's funeral. Ruby Sales kept her head low. That funeral was very hard for me because Jonathan was an only son and she only had two children. So you can imagine how I felt when I saw his mother's grief. I felt momentarily deeply saddened and to some degree slightly guilty. Jonathan fought his entire short life for freedom and justice. His activism actually began long before he was entrenched in Alabama. Jonathan's pictures helped the Wallaces include a narrative that had been missing in the civil rights movement. The voice of young people, not old enough to vote, they became the courage for their parents. So when they went to the courthouse to register to vote, they were met by a billy club wielding sheriff who intimidated them. If they made it inside, they had to take what was called a uh, literacy test, which meant that they had to know completely everything in the U.S. Constitution, everything in the state constitution. And if they got all of those questions right, there were impossible questions in addition to that, like how much water is in the Alabama River. When Jonathan arrived in Lowndes County, no African Americans were registered to vote. By the time he died, 1,000 had signed up. Nobody was conscious of, of wanting to fit into a small box called history. We were just doing our work. More than a half century after his death, Jonathan Daniels' mission is still relevant today. In the words of his long ago sermon, more souls must be reached.